I'm Dave Mowitz and welcome to Successful Farming. Today's program, I track track skid steer loaders and then size up battery powered chainsaws. We continue our tour of the phenomenal museum in Washington and after these brief messages, I tour a massive shop in the making in Washington State. So please stay tuned. Welcome to Top Shops. I first came to the Spokane Hutter and Colony some 30 years ago to see the first chemical direct injection system on use on a farm sprayer. That first ever was the brainchild of Jake Gross who fabricated that state-of-the-art technology in one of the best shops I'd ever seen at the time. As what has happened to many farm shops, expanding operations and larger equipment outgrew structures as is certainly what happened here at the colony. Jake and his crew not only needed a bigger shop, but a better equipped facility. Today we have the opportunity to see their shop in the making midway through construction. Let's go talk to Jake about the shop of their dreams. So Jake, why don't you walk us through uh, the overall dimensions of this complex that you have here? It's 400 feet long and 140 feet wide. How did you figure out for your needs here because you're servicing so much equipment in the colony. How did you figure out how much space you needed? Well, we all got together, and there's some guys that are better than others, others, and they come up with these dimensions, these sizes. For we want to put in 10 foot, no, 10 ton cranes, and 70 foot. This is pretty good length for an overhead crane. That's why it turned out to be a crane on that side, one on this side. It's 140 feet then. There was a lot of strategy had to go into usage of that space. It's just not the fact that you have a big shop. Yeah. It's really, that a big shop can be kind of worthless if you don't really think it out right. All right. So All right. how did you divide out the space? I'm not sure if it's exactly perfect. We'll learn as we go on. Right. But it's more than just maintenance. It's going to be manufacturing. It's going to be a lot of maintenance. And in our farming, uh, because we have so many varieties of crops, there's a lot of modifications being done to planters, potato planters, canola planters, whatever. We have like uh, doors. 20 foot doors, 30 foot doors, and one 40 foot door where the largest implement can fit in. And the wash bay of the north side is wide enough for two semis can stand there side by side. And pass through doors at both pass ends. Through. You had been, we got, I, we're going to show people the, the old shop you guys were in. And I remember the stuff that you were building everything in this place. Right. So was this kind of the shop of your dreams eventually to have? Exactly. It's, it's been a 50 year waiting period <laughs> <laughs> to see a shop like that. We can go in in the winter time, it's nice and warm. You can hardly need coveralls yeah. and do whatever you want to do. Yeah. We got plasma cutters, we got CNC milling machines and things like that. If someone really wants to gear up, one of my young men wants to go into machining, Here's the opportunity. Jake and his family spend considerable time on door widths and placement so as to create both multiple work bays and pass through equipment flow. You've got this large area here with a combination of doors. Mm -hmm. How did you figure out what doors to use? Is it in relationship to the work bays you wanted to create? Well, not so much as just for the fact of having them. Okay. You know. The, uh, the wider the door, the bigger the cost. Right. So the 40 foot is. Yeah, the 40 foot. So there's only one of those and that's all we need. We right. can drive in and drive out. And uh, there's uh, 30 footers right. and 20 footer. So the 40 foot, you have one of those and then you have a large area behind that door then. Yeah. So you can stage in several combines. Exactly. Or a potato harvester exactly. or bring the combine in. So that's kind of long-term, not only for big yeah. work, but long-term work too. Yeah, in the wintertime we had a 60-foot no-till drill in here. Wow. 
two potato harvesters, four are, row each, right. monster machines, and there was still room to work around. Right, and that's just in that end. Yeah. Right, in the big, and, big and machine. And these smaller bays here with the smaller trucks, that's where the semis come in when okay. they go through and service them in the winter time. Parts storage and the parts that they want to keep on hand is being given a lot of attention, Jake explains, as having the right part on hand is so crucial on not only keeping equipment running, but also running a wide variety of equipment that the colony utilizes. How far are you going to take it when it comes to parts? Because that's a question I get asked all the time by farmers is how, sh you know, we started out with filters and belts, stocking, right? And then the dealers would come out and restock you. Now guys are thinking, we're seeing more and more farmers going in with more and more advanced, more parts, so they not, they're not dead in the field. But are you thinking it would be everything up to a major repair on like an engine and transmission? Well, that, it's hard to say what exactly that's going to be, but that's, that's something we're going to, uh, with time, things are going to develop. Right. You know, there's some things we know we have to have filters, you know, especially in batteries too. And we'll have some tires just so that we're not stuck. Right. When someone's in the field, he needs a tire right now. We'll have some. Implement tires. Uh, like right now, we have uh, truck tires too. Oh, truck okay, and truck tires. Uh, and right. Especially specialty tires like the potato diggers. Oh. That's something uh, every shop in town doesn't have. Those are the things that uh, it's gonna, time is going to tell right. what you have to do. The other room that I noticed, you, you've got your smaller office, then you've got a uh, kind of washroom, you have parts storage sitting back there, and of course the boiler room. Uh, upstairs you have the mezzanine, but you also have a, a woodworking shop because you guys yeah. make a lot of your own furniture then. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a very common thing for our communities is to have a good carpenter shop. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be set up with some uh, modern equipment yeah. for machining wood. Uh, structure is a little atypical what you find in farm shops, concrete walls. And you got, a, of course, a, uh, a metal roof on the top. You're t we're talking a flat, flat roof on that. Concrete walls, that's a, a little bit more investment. Yeah. Why did you go with the concrete? The durability? It's got to last. I waited 50, 50 years to see this. <laughs> and now my grandkids and maybe great grandkids are going to be able to use it. Yeah. So you're building it for them then. Right. It's got to last. Right. It's going to yeah. last. The last stages of construction on the Spokane Hutter and Colony shop includes an office complex complete with a much needed conference room. We plan to return in a couple of years to see the completion of the offices as well as the rest of the shop. I'm looking forward to seeing all the innovations that Jake and his crew come up with in the structure's final form. I'll see you next time on another Top Shop Tour. After these brief messages, join me at auction to see what Bobcat track skid steer loaders are selling for, and then we test battery-powered chainsaws to see if they're worth their cost. So please stay tuned. Most any farmer what they would buy in their next skid steer loader and very likely they'll respond tracks. Oh that and of course always a larger loader. Well I found both of these features at an auction being conducted by Cook Auction today. Now what we have here is a 2018 Bobcat T770 that runs on tracks of course. This model also offers a rated capacity of nearly 3,500 pounds and an impressive 11 foot of lift. And this skid steer has a two-speed transmission, which is another option farmers yearn for. But there is one thing about this loader that concerns me. It's being sold with over 1,700 hours of use in just one year. I'm not concerned about the engine and transmission, which are capable of delivering thousands more hours of work before needing serious repair. It's these tracks that worry me. With over 1,700 hours of use, that could mean they need repair sooner than expected for a one-year skid steer. 
to get some answers to my concerns, I'm gonna go talk to Scott Cook about track wear and tear before this T770 sells. Scott, we're looking at that Bobcat T770, it's a 2018, but it does have 1700 hours, 1771. That must have been used at a construction site because they put a lot of hours in a short time, didn't they? Yeah, that's what we would we would guess. Now, we don't know exactly where right. it came from, but you put that many hours on a year, most farmers aren't using a skid loader that long. Whenever I talk to farmers, whenever I ask them, what are you gonna get in your next skid steer loader, they always say, tracks, well, a bigger skid steer loader, tracks, and they like the two-speed transmission, and that loader has all of that, doesn't it? Yes. So it's gonna get a lot of interest? Yeah, th at least in our country with all the cattle, Oh, uh, it will have a lot of people looking at that skid loader. It's bigger. It handles, it'll handle the hay bales a lot easier. They can load them off in and off the trailers as they come in. And yes, there's a lot of people and they all want cabin air anymore. And yeah. I don't blame them. Now that loader with this track fill concerns me a little bit. There was a lot of cuts on the tracks. So it'd been used likely on a construction site. What things should I do when inspecting a used skid steer with tracks on that the tracks itself well it's very similar to the uh, track tractors uh, check out the bogey wheels look at the the large sprocket make sure it's not wore too bad where it needs to be replaced and on those tracks uh, I've seen them many times and they'll run a long time with cracks in them mm -hmm. but it's when they wear f wear their tread down if you will no different than a tractor uh, oh. but you'll cut the tracks with you know rocks or or you know maybe some steel somewhere but uh, in general the tracks don't break that way but they will wear out the pads just like on a, a lug on a tractor tire it's kind of important to do your due diligence before bidding or heading to an auction or to a, a dealer's lot right so is that something where i could call you up ahead of time and ask about price trends oh yeah the guys put you on the spot and say what do you think it's worth they ask me that all the time <laughs> <laughs> well, i ask you what do you think it's worth i think it's 35 to forty thousand. yeah well it's going to be interesting to see because i'm thinking about the same thing so i should have stated my own i'll say 37 200 We'll see who ends up with the right price. Thanks for that information, Scott. Let's watch that Bobcat T770 sell. Put it out there right down the bay, Scott. He put it out nine, out there 39. He is nine, sure enough. He put it out there 80, 9. He put it out there 80, 9. He put it out there 80, 9. Now 40. He put it out there 80, 9. 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 What do you got? One five, two thousand. Even that eighty two. Even one five, two. Even that forty two thousand dollars. Even that forty two thousand dollars. One five, three hundred forty two thousand dollars. Here we come. Even that eighty two. Even that eighty two. Total forty one pound five hundred. Even that eighty two. Yeah. Bidding just ended at one five hundred. Even that eighty two. Even that eighty two. Bidding just ended on our Bobcat skid steer. The final price paid was forty one thousand five hundred. What? Does that price tell me about the current marketplace for skid steer loaders? Remember, this loader was clocked up over 1,700 hours. So, I found a loader sitting on a dealer's lot in Illinois that had 1,500 hours. Its asking price was $45,000. And the appraisal tool of Iron Solutions, which is the absolute best appraisal source in agriculture, finds the average values of high hour T770s like this Bobcat at 42,500. See what you can do searching online for price comparisons. Doing some online research allows you to set a price with confidence. One last bit of advice. When buying a track skid steer loader, consider that the cost of replacing tracks is 30 to 40% higher than replacing tires. New tracks can set you back 3,500 up to $5,000. So factor that pricing when you're looking at track loaders. For more information about Cook Auction, you can go to the website at cookauctionco.com. I'll see you next week on another Steel Deals Report.
couple years ago, Milwaukee introduced a cordless chainsaw. It wasn't the first cordless chainsaw in the market, but it offered to have huge amounts of power and the claims that the company was making is that that would replace any motorized chainsaw. I decided to get a farmer to test it. So I sent it to Terry Wells on Maxwell, Iowa, and you were gonna do some work on fence lines where you had to get trees out of. Now, you were running 16 inch steel mower or yeah. uh, uh, chainsaws then yeah. at that time. And you weren't sure when I sent this out what to think of it, because here it comes, a little battery <laughs> on the side. Yeah. But you put it to work, I found out you were using it quite a bit. Yeah, we use the heck out of it. We use it all the time. The, the other chainsaws, well, I always took two because when one wouldn't start, and get out the other one. Right. And then uh, this in here starts every time. Yeah, it works great. Well, this is the yeah. th this uses it's all run off an 18 volt, and this is a 12 amp hour uh, battery. So, first off. Is it one of those things you're having, if you're using it during the day, do you have to charge it a lot or does that last quite a while? It lasted all day long, but we, it didn't, didn't, really. use, we didn't use it constantly. Right. We, uh, but we used it off and on all day as we was going. Right. And then I got another battery that I took with us too. Okay. So. Well, the key to all chainsaws I know is a good sharp blade. Yeah. But certainly that's the case, but it's the power. And this thing goes to full power instantly, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. So if you were in cutting a pretty sizable limb or even a, a, a trunk on a tree, was it ever bogging down when you'd cut? Um, no, it, it stayed right with it. I mean, it would, it would bind up like any chainsaw if the branch right. bound it. Right. But uh, no, it was... But power-wise? Power-wise, it was fine. It handled it all just like the other one. So Terry, if you had to buy a new chainsaw in the 16 inch size such as this, uh, and you had the choice between a, a battery powered chainsaw like the Milwaukee we we're showing here and a, a motorized one, which would you prefer to buy? And this one here. Yeah. yeah. Because it's everything that you need right. for a farm operation. Yep. Yeah, I don't have to keep the gas and gas with me or anything. I just get it and go. Right. Just keep some oil for the bar or oil for the bar is all I need. Well, Terry, thanks a lot for testing the Milwaukee Chainsaw. I'll see you again next time on another product test team. Join me as I tour a phenomenal agricultural museum in Washington State after these brief messages. Welcome to Aegis Iron. Last week, if you remember, we started our tour of the Eastern Washington Agricultural Museum, which is a special kind of museum because of the equipment that it has, because it's nestled in the Palouse Hills of Eastern Washington, Western Idaho, and even Oregon. But also it's a museum that has a lot of unique equipment for this area that you would find. That's why it's special to come here and we broke this into a multi-tour area. So on the displays that we see, you have next to the engine area, a full branding area. Now branding was important out here for the cow-calf operation, wasn't it? Yes, sir. So you have the actual branding irons and then you showed the way that the, the brands worked? Yes, uh, they may, most of them come from the blacksmith shop and when they got done with the iron, they would heat it up and go over at that time, it was a wood building, they brand into the side of the building. And over the years, they had those brands there, and the people that owned it had the foresight to make brand blocks out of them, and took a little doing, but we finally, with some help, got the collection. Where did you find the branding irons themselves? Uh, from local. Oh my gosh, people were would donate their original brands then. Yes. That's kind of unique. I've never seen that in a museum before that you have that many. And how many, do you know how many brands that you have represented there? Well, on the blocks, there's 160 almost. Cool. And the irons, there's not that many, but there's still probably 50. Wow, that's as extensive as you'll find. Then other items that you find here, because every time I turn around, I'm noticing things, barbed wire collection. Yes, sir. With interpretation by date of the, the barbed wire then. Yes, sir. 
Good gravy. Uh, th th there was a collector that had put those together and just donated them? Uh, it's actually several collections put really? together, yes sir. But you've got a lot of tractors that were donated as well by members in the area. And a wide variety of makes and models, right? Yes, sir. So you're truly non-denominational as we see back here with the farm. Well, this is an H on steel wheels. Yes, sir. Right? And then you've got a field marshal and a John Deere, and I notice all kinds of colors that are here. Yes. Uh, is this a lot of the equipment be germane to the area? So you have crawlers too as well. Yes. So that, there was a lot of crawler uh, agriculture in this area? Because of the steep, <clears throat> steep, steepness of the hills. Yeah, crawlers were very, well, virtually when they went from horses to crawlers and then later they got to making the wheel tractors wider and, but uh, crawlers was a big thing. So David, if they want to get the information, the telephone number to, to take a tour, they should go to your website then. That's where the great starting point. Yes, sir. Well, thanks for the, the tour, but we're not done yet. There's actually a second building that's part of this museum. So we'll return next week to continue our tour of the Eastern Washington Agricultural Museum. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. I tour a great farm shop in Idaho, and then I head to auction to see what late model loader tractors are selling for. We report on a farmer's test of an innovative jump starter. We finish our tour of the Washington Agricultural Museum. See you next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.